Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will get started here in just a few minutes. Just going to give time for all the attendees to um, join the room first. So just be patient with us. Hey everyone, <clears throat> always like to see where people are around the world. Hey, like um, add your location in the chat. Um, I'm here in California, Northern California, Minneapolis. I mean, I'm wondering, you know, this uh, webinar today is really focused on USA. I'm interested to see if we have people from just all over the of the world. You yeah, have Maryland, Minneapolis, Southern Massachusetts. Okay. Arkansas, right? Rockland, California, my neighbor. Selfishly, uh, I always love doing this, you know, considering my... Um, escape from California a little bit. So I uh, like to see where, <laughs> where people are living. Alaska. Okay, great. I think this is, uh, and you know, this part gives me energy and I hope it gives you all energy, right? Um, that we are all united from around the world, this country, um, by this cause of accessibility. You know, um, we all work for the web collaboratively. Toronto, okay. Let's see, it looks like we're having a slowdown of people joining. So I'll go through our housekeeping items real quick before we get things started here. Uh, again, thank, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Carrie and I am the Senior Manager of Sales Development here at DPGI. Uh, just to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started, the the session is being recorded and we will email everyone the recording. Um, usually takes about two days after the event. We have captions available, so feel free to use those as needed. Um, we will have time for a live Q&A, so please use the Q&A box and we will answer as many of the questions as we can. Um, sometimes we miss questions if they get mixed into the chat, so try to use the Q&A box for your questions, please. And lastly, if anyone is needing any accessibility support, training, usability testing, et cetera, I will send out an email with a link to schedule time to speak with one of our experts after the webinar. And with that, I will let Aaron get started and provide an introduction of himself. Hey everyone, my name is Aaron Farber. Um, as I said, I'm based here in California. And just a, a quick um, moment about my own background. Um, I've worked on web accessibility um, for you know probably oh, nearly a decade, um, and I've I've worked on it in kind of many different capacities, right? Like so, before I came to TPGI, I had my own um, web accessibility consulting and development shop. Uh, I have a background as a, a front end developer, um, and essentially in that I. Um, <clears throat> you know, worked with very small businesses, the kind that would use like WordPress or Shopify. And uh, I'd audit their websites and I, you know, handle um, those fixes myself. Um, and, uh, you know, in that role, um, in that business, you know, I and encountered a lot of organizations typically because they were, you know, facing an accessibility complaint. And so I, I learned a lot, you know, just simply riding along in that process. Um, and then now here at TPGI, I'm, I'm, we're, supporting accessibility um, at the biggest brands in the world who are delivering cutting edge and complex applications. Um, and, you know, it, it is different, those 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 uh, different industries. Um, and I'm going to share, you know, kind of what I've learned, my impression. Um, the question of web accessibility lawsuits is such a large one. Um, we won't cover everything today. And I want to get through everything quickly so that we do have time for questions. And um, and I want to note here at the start just that it is very easy, especially when you're dealing with a legal topic, um, to say it depends, right? And and so instead, I'm trying to bring clear conclusions from this ambiguity, um, and and keep that in mind. You know, uh, 
there are asterisks and things like that. And I'm happy to get into those. And, and, um, and I, I, you know, regardless of what the marketing people say, uh, I don't have a hard stop at the end of the hour, so we can stay and, and really go through it all. So rest assured. All right. So today's topic is how to deter and win web accessibility lawsuits. Okay, so first of all, let's just look at this from the top level, the state of web accessibility litigation. There were 4,600 digital accessibility lawsuits filed in 2023. And the top 10 plaintiff side firms, right? The plaintiff is the one filing the case, right? Um, they represent around 25 plaintiffs, that is, you know, injured parties. Um, but they account for 84% of all claims, Right. So we can think about that, you know, just simply we put those lawsuits in the category of what we might term like drive by lawsuits. You can pick your your terminology. Um, and here on this, uh, we see that 33 percent of these cases are state court lawsuits and 67 percent of them are federally filed. Now, most lawsuits are based in Florida, New York and California. Um, you know, one key trend here that we're going to talk about is that the U.S. Court of Appeals, the second district here, um, they determined that essentially a plaintiff has to show concrete and particularized harm. So they're moving away from just the, the tester type claims. And plaintiffs must put forth more effort to establish standing, you know, their right to bring suit. Um, legal activity is increasingly moving from federal courts to state courts, which have more favorable state-based accessibility laws. For example, the New York State Human Rights Law, California's Jesse Unruh Civil Rights Law. Um, and, uh, you know, all of this, again, like illustrates that they are making it, the courts and our country are making it more difficult to bring these suits forward. Um, but again, just because, you know, you, you know, it, you know, with the way the internet works, right, you are selling products to all over the country. So you don't, to receive one of these lawsuits, right, like you don't have to be based in Florida, New York, or California, you just simply have to conduct business in those states. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking at electoral college maps, I think, you know, collectively, those three states probably represent 40% of the US. So, um, but we have fewer drive-by web accessibility lawsuits. You know, we have high-profile instances of unscrupulous lawyers facing consequences. For example, the San Francisco DA, Jason Boudin, um, he charges an attorney from Beverly Hills um, who sent letters just simply demanding settlements and falsely claiming to file suit. Um, so here we see, um, if you go to that lawyer's uh, state bar page, uh, they display the scarlet letter. Right, that they're facing a felony for sending these 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 ADA lawsuits. Um, and if you feel you've been unfairly targeted, you know, consider you know again and, and consider letting law enforcement know. You know that won't resolve the issue for you, right, necessarily. But you'll be doing, I think, your role as a good citizen. And I just want to underline again, you know, is that there are many ways to respond to these cases and to, uh, you know, um, and deter these cases. And I'm covering only a limited number here. And, and I swear, that's the last disclaimer I want to provide of that kind. Um, oh, wait, how, what? How did this slide get in here? Um, Saul Goodman from uh, Breaking Bad. I don't know what this guy is doing in here. Um, all right, well, let's, let's keep moving. Um, all right, so uh, the industry breakdown here, um, we see that 82% of the websites um, which receive these lawsuits are e-commerce, um, and 18% represent other industries, you know, that's restaurants and food services and education, and, um, and I want to thank, you know, Usable Net and, and Safe Arth and Shaw, you know, for doing this research, which I've used, and then and they are such leaders in accessibility and um, a great resource. So credit to them. Um, now, fewer than 10% of these suits ever reach a jury, right? Going to court is expensive and unpredictable. Most businesses reason that it's less expensive to settle. Of course, right? Settlement does not stop receiving future lawsuits. 
Um, it's not, you know, you've given your pound of flesh and that's it, right? Like 25% of the lawsuits filed in 2023, 24 were against companies who had previously received lawsuits. So if you do receive one, uh, you know, it is incumbent on you to, to resolve those issues. Um, but we're going to keep moving. All right. So the lawsuit origins, right? So we're talking about these 4,600 lawsuits and they're indiscriminate on some level, but they're not totally indiscriminate, right? So why are some sites targeted more than others? I think that's the key question here that we're concerned with. Um, so first of all, the lawsuits range in quality and level of effort expended by the plaintiff firm. So we'll talk more about that. Um, however, there's two clear aspects which draw the attention of plaintiff firms. That is accessibility overlays and automated scans. All right, so what it, accessibility overlay, um, these are widgets, which you may see at the, at the bottom of websites, right? It resembles, you know, the handicap placard. Um, it's a little button. Um, these widgets recreate browser-based or assistive technology features. And uh, some change, you know, for example, uh, this is, it would be like, they would allow you to magnify the page or increase the text size, um, those kinds of things, which are already natively available in the browser or through an assistive technology such as Zoom text. Some of these overlays have their own screen reader. Um, some of these overlays, now they're going a step further and they're changing the HTML markup at runtime. So basically after the page loads, the overlay is applying changes to the markup, dynamically changing it rather than changing the underlying source code, right? So we see the difference there, right? Overlay, changing it when the page loads versus your developer going into your WordPress theme, your Shopify theme and changing that code. 20% um, of these lawsuits filed are against websites using widgets, predominantly accessibility. Um, there were 449 suits in 2023 and over 500 in 2024. Um, now, a question to the audience and add this into the chat. Think about this from the perspective of a web accessibility tester, a lawyer, a litigator involved in this topic. When you see a website that is using an accessibility overlay, what signal does that send to you? So add it in the chat, I'd be curious what people say. Um, I'm going to take just like 15 seconds, which is not enough time. So please, you know, I hope you type hundred words per minute. Um, and then I'll, I'll share my thoughts, but add it in the chat. They don't know enough to fix digital accessibility, band-aid fix client, poor site, unserious, no effort. I'd like to see at least 80% of those with overlays being taken to court, uh, my man. Um, that you've done your due diligence and your site is good to go. Um, I like that. I don't know if that's uh, like sarcastic, um, Mary, but I, if it is, I like your style. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of the dry sarcasm. Um, all right. So to me, right, accessibility in a single line of code is not possible and it's demonstrably false, right? Plaintiff firm and accessibility subject matter experts' perception is that these businesses took a shortcut and they did not consider accessibility in the design and development of their website, um, right? Because they're applying these changes at the end of the process rather than at the start, right? Um, and the overlay to me indicates that the business may be unable to remediate their website in a timely basis, right? These tools exist for business and develop business convenience, right? Because it is many of these businesses, especially the kind that I formerly worked with, right? Don't have the technology or the orientation to resolve accessibility issues perhaps on their own, right? So that's why they're doing this overlay. And in a sense that makes them a target because it shows that they are gonna have difficulty responding. But most importantly, overlays may not improve user experience. The web accessibility community, some of the people on this call, right, 
has painstakingly documented that these tools do not improve the user experience for people that use assistive technologies. To learn more about this topic, you can go to overlayfalseclaims.com. And I will note that I want to add this here, and it's important. These overlays do have potential and value as technology. Applying JavaScript-based overlays at times is the only way to change third-party code or things that you may not have, a, you may not control that code base. Also, with the advent of AI, these tools are getting better. They are able to recognize buttons and headings and things of that like on the page. So um, I actually have hope for these tools. I believe they have value, but at this time, they are not enough to get you to 100% accessibility. Right. And there's no such thing in a sense as partial conformance. Um, it's full, it's binary, it's full or not. Of course, now, right? I, I they, 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 they didn't initially market themselves that way. Businesses are rebelling against some of these overlays. So, for example, um, a New York City based dermatology <clears throat> practice um, filed class action lawsuit against Accessibility alleging false advertising and ineffectiveness. Um, uh, you know, this was reported on by uh, Mikal Nowicki, um, who's, uh, you know, an attorney for a prominent uh, law firm involved in these cases. Now, on to automated scans. To me, more than, you know, we said 20% of the lawsuits have widgets. And by the way, it is very easy, you know, not only can you visually determine whether a site has a widget, but you can easily determine that through audit, through scans of the web. Um, I myself have done scans of large numbers of websites. You can determine what plugins and libraries are being used in the website. It's very easy. Um, so, but, but moving on, automated scans are the most common trigger for a drive-by lawsuit. Simply put, right? Like plaintiffs, firms can easily run scans on websites. They have limited expertise, but when a site contains a large number of issues, the plaintiff firm then delves deeper into the site. Perhaps, you know, then they instruct the screen reader user to go to the site because, right, one cannot receive a lawsuit because of WCAG violations. Maybe in a superficial sense, right? But one receives a lawsuit because someone cannot use the site as they normally use the web. And typically, right, if there are WCAG violations, that means they are unable to use the site as they normally use the web. Now, Automated scans are improperly used by plaintiff firms. I want to emphasize that using an automated scan in litigation without express consent violates the terms of service. And that is true for most automated accessibility vendors, whether it is TPGI or WAVE. Um, so if you receive a complaint, uh, and, uh, you know, or you receive a, a demand letter, I understand those things can be separate and, um, let the automated scan, and they've used an automated scan in the results. They've explicitly like included, attached that or used that, alluded to it. Let the automated scan vendor know. Again, it will not exempt you from that lawsuit or anything like that. But again, you'll be doing your, your, your role as a good internet citizen. Um, and so here we see that WAVE, uh, which is, 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 is a web accessibility evaluation tool from um, a, a not-for-profit organization called uh, WebAIM. Um, here we see language from their website. It says, it is not our intent that WAVE be used for legal or litigation purposes. While WebAIM supports the civil rights of individuals with disabilities to access web content and provide services to help organizations implement accessibility, WAVE cannot provide a good measure of discrimination. Its use in legal actions can cause confusion and may suggest relationships with complaints, litigants, and defense that are not valued. In bold, the use of WAVE or WAVE results data for any purpose related to a legal action is not allowed without written permission. If you are aware of WAVE being used in violation of these terms, please contact us. And I will say that even upon receiving cease and desist, I know that some of these um, uh, law firms continue to use these scans, but nonetheless, we have to we have to continue we have to continue that 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 work of of of, of discouraging that behavior. Um, TPGI here, we are advocates for disability. We um, for people with disabilities, it's um, 
it's it's in our family it's in our dna it's it's who we are you know so um you know we are not at all uh, you know supportive of our our scan results being used in this manner okay um now evaluating automated scan results um first of all check whether the results are testing applicable accessibility standards i you know we're going to talk more about this in a sec but i see this happen actually right um, and the prevailing online accessibility standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA. Let's look at why. Okay, so first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about WCAG, right? WCAG is um, produced by the World Wide Web Consortium, which is a you know, essentially volunteer group of people around the world who are involved in web governance. That's the authors of, of the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, so the first, you know, 2.0, I'll say the first, but version 2.0 was published in 2008. 2.1 was published in 2018. And 2.2 was published in October, 2023. Um, so for the time being, WCAG 2.0 or WCAG level or version, I should say not level, but version 2.0 or 2.1 is kind of the standard that I've seen referenced by courts and government agencies. Um, although some states, especially when it comes to their own in, you know, governmental mandates, they have signaled that they will shift to 2.2 as the standard in 2025. But for now, I have, again, I have not seen um, any court require conformance with 2.2. Um, and here we see a we see a table, and we can see that from 2.0 there were a total of 38 success criteria, which is in you know guidelines um, in WCAG terms. Um, we moved from 38 in 2.0 to 50 in 2.1, and 57 in 2.2. So each of these is 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 supplementary, right? Like. Um, to pass 2.1, you have to pass 2.0. To pass 2.2, you have to pass 2.1. Um, but as I say, like, so so there is perhaps more complexity involved in these, although I will say that the most of these new success criteria, they are concerned with kind of like clarifying ambiguities and gaps in the previous uh, WCAG. Um, all right, now let's talk about the levels, right? So we talked about the versions. Um, now let's talk about the levels. So WCAG is three levels of conformance. There's level A. This ensures just the most basic level of access for disabled people. It does not provide an equivalent user experience. Level AA ensures disabled people do not encounter significant barriers. It provides a mostly equivalent user experience. Level AAA enhances the user experience for disabled people and it assures accommodation for people who may have multiple disabilities. Now thinking, we thought about WCAG conformance levels in technical terms. Let's talk about it in human terms, right? Or I mean, I'm sorry, the opposite, right? We talked about it in human terms, let's talk about it in technical terms now. So to make an application accessible, right? Could require changes to a site's code base, and AKA engineering, um, or changes to a site's visual appearance. Um, so level A does not require one or two. Okay, so level double A requires one or two. Level triple A requires one and two. So if we were to use an example here, right, like an image missing alternative text, um, that's a level A issue because um, that is a feature alternative, uh, images natively support alternative text that doesn't require any custom or significant engineering. And also it doesn't change the site's visual appearance. Color contrast, that can be easy to solve, right? We simply change a, a color value, a hexadecimal code, right? In the CSS. And um, that's very easy to do, but nonetheless, it's level AA because that involves a change to the site's visual appearance. Um, so again, like, you know, these, these levels of effort involved in these are, are, are not, you know, not, not perfect, right? Like they're an approximation. Now level AAA, like, you know, is an example would be um, one, one of those AAA guidelines, again, success criteria. 
is, is to have like a sign language interpreter, right? So think about that. That involves additional work, significant work, and it changes the site's visual appearance, right? Um, so WCAG level AA is the established legal remedy. You know, basically, right, like courts said, hey, we don't have the specialized knowledge to understand what constitutes an accessible website. You say you can't access this website. We, we don't necessarily know what makes up an accessible website. But hey, the World Wide Web Consortium, these people, they have done a lot of, they've put in, you know, an immeasurable amount of work in determining um, what makes an accessible website. So uh, LACAG level AA is often set as the remedy. Like if your site is inaccessible, hey, conform to that. Level AAA is never set as the standard. I, uh, in my time here at TPGI, which is approaching on five years, you know, um, I, I don't know what anniversary that is. Um, somebody let me know in the chat so I can I can let my my manager know. Um, so uh, you know, level in my time here at TPGI, um, I have never heard of an organization striving to conform to level AAA. Um, you know, but nonetheless, you know, it is promoting a high quality user experience um, that is that is that is difficult to achieve. So you know, again, I like level AAA, but um, it's just. When organizations receive scan results containing level A issues or best practices, these are inherently low priority. Um, and here we see a screenshot of a level AAA, six issues on 18,000 pages. That's a screenshot from a recent accessibility complaint file, or I'm not complaint, but a summons or whatever filed in court. Um, that or you know, that organization as part of that summons, they included as evidence an automated scan result. Uh, which did include level AAA issues. So, and, and so, you know, my first, you know, you know, comment to them was like, well, you know, that's, that's not, that's not really valid, you know, because that's, that's not a standard that you're ever going to be, you know, realistically required to conform to. Um, th thanks, Jed. But I, I wanted to know, do I get like a paper gift or do I get like tin? W what do I get for that anniversary? You know? Um, so, uh, run your automated scans, um, though, right? So we've talked about what triggers these lawsuits. And so we already have some thoughts here, right? Like number one, having an overlay puts too much more risk. And, um, number two is having large numbers of automated errors on your, ish on your site is going to raise, you know, draw attention to you, right? So don't wait for litigation. Run and run automated scans on your website to understand your, your level of risk. And running an automated scan in and of itself does not require accessibility expertise, right? Like you as a product owner or something, you can run that scan and you can deliver it to others um, to evaluate. And, and, and um, but, okay, all right, I'm going to run an automated scan. But which one? Where, where Which one am I going to use? All right, so... I'm going to compare R, which is our in-house rules engine, um, with AxeCore, which is open source and used widely across the web. Um, you know, there are multiple vendors and, you know, and the automated rule engines overlap in the results they return, but there's limited value in running scans with the different engines because, again, they overlap so much and and honestly, just in practice, like you would be devoting a lot of effort to like matching the two, like, okay, it's like this issue and this one, and then this one's referring to the same thing. It's not a great use of your time. So just pick one, okay? Now, AxCore is driven by its marketing pitch and philosophy. Um, uh, is the slide deck available? Hey, I'm sorry, Russ, it'll be available afterwards. Um, that's a great question. And um so comparing ARC and uh, AxCore. So ARC's, AxCore is driven by its marketing pitch and philosophy, no false positives. And, and, and so that means no mistaken accessibility findings. And, you know, it's actually a very restrictive standard. You know, you think about the web is vast with a lot of edge cases. Um, now, ARC is concerned with the different permutations of browser and assistive technology. It, it casts a wider net. And ultimately, you know, information is power. These results are for yourself. Um, whoops, clicked elsewhere. 
Now, ARC and most vendors, automated vendors, are going to report scan results in a really similar way, though. So here in ARC, we refer to it as an error. We have we report three kinds of things. An error, an element automatically identifies WCAG violation, um, an alert, um, an element which requires further manual inspection to confirm as a WCAG violation, and uh, a best practice, an element which may not represent a WCAG violation but impacts the user experience. So, you know, Axe has similar things, right? Like they have, I believe their category names are going to be like failure and versus like needs review. And then I think they have best practice, right? But it, essentially it's the same thing. It's the same idea here. Now I want to have a note about Google Lighthouse here, right? So Google Lighthouse is an automated testing suite built into the Chrome browser, right? If you open developer tools, right? You inspect the, the pages code. Um, you can, you know, there's Lighthouse there and you can run tests uh, for uh, your on your site's performance, accessibility, SEO, whether you're a progressive web app. Uh, don't worry about that one. Um, and in the accessibility scan used by the Lighthouse, they use a subset of Axe Core and they also apply WCAG 2.2. So they include results from WCAG 2.2. Now, as I said, it uses a subset. So using Google Lighthouse will report uh, more wrong, fewer issues than Lighthouse. Um, so I'll apologize, you know, I gotta change that slide here. Um, so again, like using Axe, the scan in, in or Arc or in these things is gonna report more issues. And that makes sense, right? Like it's built into the Google browser. They understand how these scans are gonna be used by, um, uh, you know, at perhaps adversarial forces. So they're going to be cautious about what they report, you know. Now, automated scan best practices. So with ARC monitoring, that's in our web-based platform, and you can talk to us. Uh, um, I'm trying to to not, you know, we're, we're not going to spend too much time covering our products. Um, you can provide a homepage URL and let ARC crawl and analyze your entire domain. Most vendors are going to have a similar product or approach, right, where they scan your site. Now, the one thing to keep in mind here is that these scans evaluate pages as they appear on page load, right? And typically, um, you know, uh, typically like e-commerce sites, you're going to touch a trigger content to appear, right? Um, and that's where it's great to use the Arc Toolkit Chrome extensions to test deep, deeper into user journeys. With Arc Toolkit, you can run a scan whenever, wherever. So our toolkit makes it easy to scan pages which require authentication, like you have to log in. Um, pages which are behind a firewall or other security policies, right? So you can be doing this on your staging or lower level dev environment. Um, and you can test specific points in user journeys, even local file URLs, right? So, um, so in short, right, the advantage of Chrome extensions is you can get the page into your preferred state, then open developer tools and, and run your scan. So you can open the shopping cart or add an item or whatever and run your scan. And then that gives you more visibility. And, and of course, those are critical processes within your site. And, um, and again, like, you know, anyone can run these scans using these Chrome extensions. Yes, it does require more knowledge to, um, to evaluate them, but you know, the, the primary strength of, uh, arc tool, of ARC monitoring, that is compared to ARC Toolkit, is that, you know, each issue is connect, mapped to resources on how to understand, test, and solve that issue. Um, all right. So now let's talk about it. The most common automated errors cited in lawsuits. The lack of a text alternative. So that's traditional images or image-based links or SVG-based controls is at the heart of nearly 50% of automated errors detected in a broad-based scan of e-commerce sites. So um, WCAG success criteria 1.1.1 non-text content at 2.44.4 link purpose in context are the most common violations cited in lawsuits by far. Um, so in other words, images missing alternative text and links lacking any text, right? So um, without any text, a screen reader user who can't you know, visually perceive the page um, 
without that text, they don't they don't know the destination of the link, right? They'd have to open the link and go, you know, move, navigate around that page to determine what it is. So as I said, image-based links and controls represent multiple WCAG violations. So, and I think this is a topic that, you know, this is a design pattern so common in e-commerce websites. Um, we think about like the product gallery page, um, you know, and, and here's usually how I see it go is that you'll have like a product and then you have some text beneath, you know, so here we have an image of a sneaker um, and then we have text underneath on the product. And uh, for 220, um, is that pounds or euros? I, gosh, you know, I'm such uh, an American. Like, um, and, uh, you know, but we see here that the product label text is located outside the product image based link. So, you know, that's multiple WCAG violations at once, right? Because we have an image missing alternative text. That's one report. That's one thing reported. Then we have a link lacking a, any text. So that's a second thing, because again, since the image doesn't have all text, the link doesn't have any text. So that that's two issues. And then depending on how you flag this, some automated scan engines may even flag this as a 4.1.2 issue because it has no name, right? So name role value. Um, and then we don't have to, we don't have to be too concerned here today with the, uh, this, you know, the particularities of, of WCAG reporting. Okay. Um, but the point is it, it's one that really shows up in a scan and makes your site look like you have a lot of automated scan results. And the solution is simple. You know, here is, you know, to simply enclose the image and the text in a single link. Right. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And um, it's a Euro. Okay. And um, so make the product an image and product title text into a single link. Um, I have a, a resource here from uh, Adrian Roselli, a former TPGI engineer. Um, it's great and very in-depth. It's really developer-centric. Um, next source for the most common assertion is, is, is related to number one, and we're just going to elaborate about it a second further, is, is icon-based navigation menu buttons. I've seen this reference multiple times is that they say, um, that essentially the hamburger menu button lacks an accessible name. Um, so, and, and that of course is a critical issue, right? Like, you know, the hamburger menu is a gate, you know, triggers your navigation menu to appear. Um, you know, that's a gateway to navigating the site and it gets overlooked. Um, I will say, you know, it's funny because it's just a tribute to, you know, kind of the, um, the lack of expertise of some of these plaintiff firms is that I very rarely see them perform automated scans on the mobile layout. It almost seems to be entirely on the desktop layout, um, which, you know, is, it's, is, um, you know, again, you know, is, is just a symbol of, you know, of, of kind of their, their, you know, actual effort and, and, you know, genuine, you know, authenticity in filing these claims because we know that 50% of, of, of web users are, are using a phone, right? So the mobile layout is very important. All right, now the source for most common issues for assertions, I say assertions, as in we assert that these elements do not conform to an automated rules engine. Um, sites which use ARIA, simply put, have more automated errors, okay? ARIA is used for modern UI patterns, which cannot be achieved in native HTML alone. So for example, tab panels, expandable collapsible widgets. Now, how do you recognize an ARIA widget, right? So let's say you're a, well, you know, let's say a product owner, I'm going to put this in both terms. Like, let's say you're a product owner or a developer. How do you recognize an ARIA widget, right? So a developer, of course, you can open the code, you can look at it, but, but I honestly, you don't even have to, right? An ARIA widget is a JavaScript powered interaction, right? JavaScript is how we we make the web move, right? How we 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 it, it it's it's it, JavaScript adds the functionality to a web page in short. So you click on something and it changes page content without reloading the page. That's using JavaScript, right? So that's how you know if it is a JavaScript powered interaction. Again, like something is dynamically changing the page. 
that's an ARIA widget, most likely. If it's lacking ARIA, then it probably needs ARIA, right? Um, but here's the thing. ARIA carries very precise specifications. So it's easy to misconfigure. So again, like if you're not using ARIA in the proper way, it's going to actually result in a lot of automated errors. Um, so, you know, we have to be careful in using ARIA. Um, now, there are steps to overcome ARIA-based issues. Now, ARIA is very... Um, and I, I realize I haven't said enough about ARIA here, but just to explain here, right, it's to contextualize those changes in the page, right? It's to bring sound from silence, you know, in a sense, right? Because like a person clicks on something for a screen reader user, that has to trigger an announcement. So ARIA exists to trigger those announcements and provide dynamic feedback. That's a very developer-ish thing, you know, like, and um, so... You know, simply put, like if I was a product, if I was a site owner, you know, the simplest way to overcome ARIA based issues is just to simplify the interface. For example, here we see um, uh, a, a table uh, headers. We see the first column is ticket types. Um, it's, it's essentially a horizontally scoped header. Um, then the second column is advanced. Um, and then it has a tooltip icon. And then the last column is day of with an icon. But, but in any case, the point is here is that after advance, that tooltip is expanded and says, get tickets in advance and save. Yeah, tooltips don't follow a standardized pattern, right? That, that's we, we, that's going to be difficult to solve, right? Um, so, you know, maybe, again, rather than, you know, and, and in this case with this organization, we actually did custom code to make those tooltips accessible. Again, it's a good level of effort. Alternatively, we could have just had permanent text. We could have just said, get tickets in advance and save. We could have just put that text right under advanced. Having text is inherently accessible, right? So that's the easiest way to overcome ARIA issues is just simply to remove your ARIA and do a simpler interface. Okay. Also, PDFs can be a target. And I will say it is very difficult to make accessible PDFs without specialized training. Automated scans do flag PDFs, um, and the PDFs almost always contain errors. And using, and, and but more than that, right? Like using a PDF is, is not really a very positive user experience. You know, it assumes that the user has, uh, you know, the requisite software, they have Acrobat or whatever. Plus, using a PDF, um, browsers are inconsistent, unreliable in how they render PDF content. So instead, you know, we can solve PDF simply by creating an accessible HTML form or using Google Forms, right? Like external or it could be embedded in your website, right? So uh, you, you have a form, um, you know, to, to get a, a refund or a rebate or something like that could be a Google Form. Um, so again, like, you know, simply just removing PDFs from your site can be another way to kind of reduce um, you know, the, uh, the attention that you draw. Now, color contrast in the context of lawsuits. Now, this one is kind of a, is, is, is an interesting one. So a single line of CSS can result in hundreds of errors. Um, <laughs> I mentioned my name here, um, because I want to emphasize that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not I'm omniscient. Okay. Like others on this call, if you have a different experience than me in this respect, I would love if you would add it in, in the chat. But I do not know of any litigation, web accessibility litigation, that has been predicated on color contrast. And that makes sense, right? Because color contrast is rarely going to prevent someone entirely from using a website, right? It's, it's poor user experience. It's an inconvenience. It makes it harder to, to use the website, but doesn't prevent someone from using it entirely. And, uh, and more than that, a lot of people that have color blindness and other things like that, um, you know, they have Chrome extensions, they have other, you know, they have methods to, um, to, to make pages to enhance color contrast on their own native browser. So they may not even experience the issue in the first place, all right? Now, AxCore, the uh, rules engine, um, states that color contrast is the most common issue in their automated scans. So we see in AxCore, when they run scans, 30% of all issues are color contrast issues. 
So again, it is by far the most common thing flagged in a automated scan. Because again, the way that websites are built, right? Like you picture like a table with all these cells. Well, if each, you know, a human being looks at that and says that table has poor color contrast, automated scan result is going to say, hey, you have a 10 by 10 table, that's 100 cells, you have 100 instances of, of low color contrast. Wow, that's going to blow up your automated scan results. And what's so frustrating about this to me is that I see it's drawing, in a way, it's drawing attention to your site because you have all these automated scan issues. But then when they actually file a claim, they're not able to reference color contrast because we are concerned with cult with with um with screen reader users right that's that's going to be our plaintiff right so we can't say our screen readers plaintiff also complains about color contrast because right that that wouldn't make sense here so um all right now we talked about the automated scan results and most common things here right your job is to gauge the impact on user experience of each automated scan results Typically, that's the first thing teams do in reaction to a complaint or demand letter, especially if it contains automated scan results. And, um, and you know, prior to TPGI, that was a business I had in some respect, right? That like an attorney would reach out to me like, hey, can you verify uh, or gauge the impact of these claims? Are they legitimate? And then based on that, you know, they use that information in, in their legal, in their arbitration processes, right? Now, um, uh, the quality of a complaint, this is on my mind right now. I have encountered a lot of people recently who have received accessibility lawsuits, and that's partly what motivated this, this case. Um, consider the two claims here. Buttons do not have, and I've seen both of these in complaints recently. One, buttons do not have accessible names versus it is not possible to determine what color is selected. I, I should say when I met when buying a shirt, okay? Um, we can tell which one of those claims is more valid, meaningful, and genuine. They're the same claim, right? They're the same claim, but one person has just thrown you automated scan results. The other person has, the plaintiff that is, has actually gone this additional step to gauge the impact on user experience and demonstrate that this is a barrier, right? So I have so much more respect for the second claim and it is much more compelling in legal context. Now, we're gonna cover a couple of things quickly um, here. Um, does having a phone number protect you from web accessibility claims? No, it does not. No, it doesn't. But stating that you can provide accessibility support over the phone is, is helpful to users and it is empathetic but it does not exempt you from having to solve website issues, right? Because a phone number does not provide an equivalent user experience to having a site that can be used at any time of day. Um, and you know, a lot of this web accessibility topic started because of ATMs, because they did not have a voice interface. And some banks initially argued, well, the person can go into the branch, that's an option. And the court said, well, you know, that's not the same, you know? um as being able to do it at any time of day and that makes sense right i mean i like to buy my shirts at 1 a.m like at impulsively that's how i do my shopping i don't want to have to rely on a phone number you know um but moving on keep it keep it moving um all right so now accessibility statement now i have seen some complaints cite the lack of an accessibility statement it's an interesting one, right? Because to me, it's kind of like they're throwing, um, what, what is the phrase? They're throwing spaghetti against the wall? I don't, I don't know. But they're looking for ways to just like bolster their claim, right? So they're going to say things like, hey, we went to your site multiple times on this date, that date, the other date, and that makes their claim more compelling. They don't have an accessibility statement. They have no way for us to provide accessibility feedback. That's, again... So again, like every e-commerce vendor should have an accessibility statement. It's a setting to document your substantive efforts on accessibility, the things that you have done and provide an accessibility feedback mechanism. It's a top deterrent to plaintiff firms. They're gonna look at that. 
And, and to me, you know, state, if you are working with a respected accessibility vendor, the people, in, those lawyers understand who are legitimate vendors. And if you put forth effort, now I will say, if you're working with TPGI, please check with your account manager if you were going to use language referring to TPGI. Um, and we can help you with that. And, and, you know, this is a major topic, you know, we've, you know, um, because some states are, are wanting to see more of your, you're talking about um, having uh, 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 basically, or, 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 you know, we have here in California, for example, you know, we are considering litigate, we're considering legislation where you have to state whether um, you have worked with like a professionally and accredited like accessibility vendor. Um, that's, that's not currently the law here. Um, we passed it out of committee a few times and then the legislature looked at it and was like, actually, this is a pretty consequential law. So we, we, it's been punted to next year and I'll let you know. Um, no, yes. Post in the site's footer. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Now I was talking earlier about how most people settle. Some don't settle. Um, here on Twitter, I saw this recently. Um, Beard Brand, um, cate you know, received a classic drive-by uh, lawsuit from one of these um, plaintiff firms that have sent out, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of them. Um, and so they were sued for 75000 That's the maximum limit under New York's uh, human rights law. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't a reputable claim in a sense, right? Um but they didn't give in, they didn't settle, and they won. And here's what happened. And I looked into this a little bit and talked to them. Um, is essentially they, you know, most of the complaint was just boy or plain language. It didn't actually refer to their site. It was just like, you know, but they had only one or two legitimate claims in there and and they denied all of the claims. They just simply denied them. If I look at their legal response, they just say we categorically deny claim one, claim two, et cetera. And in response, the plaintiff firm simply dropped the case. They did not go to court. And I think, you know, that reflects that the level of effort that these plaintiff firms are willing to expend on filing the claim reflects, I mean, the level of effort that these plaintiff firms expend on filing the claim reflects the level of effort that they will make to carry on the claim. You know, so they, in a sense, you know, you can frame it as, you know, the um, bullying on some level, right? Um, and and sorry, you know, the story doesn't necessarily have a happy ending, right? That you don't get to, they don't, because the case gets dismissed or something like that, you, you don't get them to pay your attorney fees, right? Like for the lawyers on here, you know that getting people to pay your attorney fees is, is a separate legal process. Um, and so most likely you won't, you're not gonna get that done. Um, this person, they're active on social media. They wanna have, they wanna fight, they wanna do stuff. Um, for attention and, and, you know, again, and I'm grateful to them for that. And, and I gave them a click. So, okay. Um, now what to ask for if you must sell, right? Not everybody can be a beer brand for a variety of reasons. And, and you may have a legitimately inaccessible site, right? Like it may have, you know, very critical barriers. First of all, the number one thing to ask for is just simply longer remediation timelines, extend them, give yourself more time to work. That's a key negotiation point. Second, be strong in arguing against claims, okay? So, and so fix these things while the complaint is in motion. And again, you can go into those and, and demonstrate you've solved this. Now, here's the TPGI plan in one year. And I, again, I don't wanna focus on TPGI here today. Yes, uh, well, yeah, please do actually focus on TPGI. I'm sorry for the marketing people, let me rephrase that, right? Um, First thing that we'll do here, and we have a plan for e-commerce retailers. So again, I hope you reach out to TBGI and just learn more about the plan and, and you know, and, and we can, and again, like you don't even necessarily have to do a TBGI, right? Like, but the, you know, so don't, you know, TBGI will help be there for every step of the way, but it's about the vision here, right? First thing is to run automated scans, understand your current state of accessibility and how others perceive your site. Then what TBGI does is we manually test the key user journeys, right? Because automated scans have their limits. And for e-commerce sites, we know the key user journeys that have to be tested manually that deserve the highest level 
of scrutiny, visibility, and have the most impact. And from this automated scan results and from the manual testing, we provide you batches of issues to work for, work on for each dev cycle. And that's great because, you know, I find most except, you know, e-commerce sites, you have a dev firm you work with, you get 20 hours a month dev time with them or whatever amount. Hey, we'll help you use it. We'll give you stuff for them to work on and you can, you know, demonstrate the changes to your site. Since you're scanning it, you have defensible data points validating your work on accessibility, showing continuous improvement. And then here at TPGI, you get regularly scheduled check-ins with an accessibility expert. Um, and, and again, that's great because not every organization really needs a full-time accessibility expert, but I think you, you need access to one at any time, right? You see the difference? Um, so yes, let's make it accessible. And I want to say one last thing here, right? I've talked, I want to emphasize here, you know, we talked about these lawsuits and I feel like some people on this phone, in this chat have a negative opinion of these lawsuits. Sure. Yes, it's, 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 I would like for it to be a regulated process where you have a, you receive a complaint and you have an amount of time to remediate your site before you face a, uh, you know, penalty. I think that would be a good approach. States are, you know, Virginia, California, other states are considering laws that basically will do that. But again, you know, we have the ADA because of the, it's actually, constant. it's constitutional basis. It's actually the uh, Interstate Commerce Act that um, it is a burden to interstate commerce for people with disabilities to not know whether they can be served at a particular location, right? Brown v. Board of Education, we got rid of integrate, we got rid of segregation in the United States because um, it was determined that that was a burden on interstate commerce. It wasn't reasonable to go to a hotel or something you're traveling and, um, and not know where they can serve you. So when you are making something, you know, accessibility, security, this, this is why so accessibility is why America is the greatest economy in the world and one that everybody wants to participate in. And you are playing a role in that. And um, and so we all work for the web, as I said. We're at the end of the hour, but I will stay for questions. I'm happy to take them on any topic. Um, yeah, I, I know I said that, but yes. So yeah, um, thank you for your attendance. And you know what? Just by being here, you are all making a substantive effort on accessibility. You're showing leadership, you're putting thought, and um, and you know what? You are free to reach out to me over LinkedIn or otherwise, and and I'll help, you know, um, as much as I can. So, um, and, and, you know, here, you know, so uh, again, we're all in this together and I appreciate your effort. Yeah, let's see if there's any good questions. Sorry, I was talking so fast, by the way. I know I have a lot to cover. I have a lot of things that, you know, want to get to. And I didn't even get to all of them. I wanted to actually talk about Shopify some because uh, I'm a big supporter of Shopify. Because Don't they... see where you missed any questions, at okay. least through the chat. I think you answered anything I saw come through. Yeah. And so to elaborate on that last thought here, you know, the reason I'm a big fan of Shopify is because they own the payment page. The payment page is critical and Shopify makes it accessible. They are a leader in accessibility. They're very skilled. And so you know that that page is going to be accessible and you don't have to worry about, oh, the error handling for if they don't put in a CVV or something like that. That's going to be very difficult things to fix, you know? Um, all right. So let's see. We have a comment here. I want to tell my users that the product's meant for designers, hence they have no motor or visual disability. I don't quite understand that comment, Hannah. But um, free to reach out. How do I, how do I tell my users that the product is meant for designers? Hence, they have no motor or visual disability. They very well could. They very well could. You know, um, people have all types of disabilities. You 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 can't um, you can't perceive, and. Um, so again, they, they may very well have that. And then, you know, I speak from my own experience, of course. Um, my father has retinitis pigmentosa. He's been blind, you know, essentially most of my life. He is a medical doctor, okay? 
so people don't expect him to be blind, you know? Um, so uh, again, like you never know, okay? And um, and people also have temporary disabilities and things. And, and again, you know, regardless of, we don't get to make the determination of who uses our product. Think about that reasoning. If we said, hey, we don't have this kind of person that comes in. It's not how our economy works. And again, that's why America is the greatest economy because of that expectation that you can be, you can be served anywhere. So, you know. We've had uh, two additional questions pop in the Q&A. Okay, should I tell my users on the website before they register that the tell is meant for those who have no disabilities? I would not say that. I think that would be explicitly stating that you are discriminating. I think that would be a, you know, I, I not only, I think that's wrong, number one, but that's a, not important. No, I, I think it increases your, uh, your, your legal liability. It's similar to um, how years ago, I recall a case where there was a website that had a one version and then it had an accessible version. So it's like you could click on the accessible version and then essentially it was like a stripped down version of the website, you know, without all the images and decorative stuff, which, you know, might've been complicated for a screen user to understand. Courts basically viewed that as like, hey, that's separate, but, e but equal, right? Like you, you, you can't, prompt, that is not an equivalent experience. So I just think like doing those things where you're explicitly stating like, hey, here's the disabled route. No, you're going to implicate yourself. So don't do that. Yeah. So, hey, great, everybody. Thanks for hanging on another two minutes. Um, and there's there's two questions in the q &A. Oh, is there? Geez. All yeah. right. Let me see here. Oh, in the q and A, I I forget. We got some multiple things here. All right. What is the timeline to react to a lawsuit? You know, it's interesting, right? So that process with Beard Brand lasted about 12 months. And um, to me, you want to rapidly respond to the lawsuit and forcefully. You know, so um, I don't know about the timeline to react to a lawsuit. There is one thing that I wanted to cover here, which I did not today. Um, so limited time, but I'll share a story for people that are hanging on. Um, I used to live in LA and um, there was a, a, a bar at the Grove. That's a big mall in LA. Um, and, you know, they received a complaint like this and they essentially ignored it. They, they just put it in the trash. And they actually, because they have ignored it over the course of, I think, nine months, something like that, they ignored it for nine months. They actually became the first business in California to receive a $4,000 penalty on the, under the Jesse Unruh Act. Okay. So um, I don't know the exact time, but I think you want to respond promptly. Um, and, uh, and again, like, I just think in terms of warding off these plaintiff lawsuits, it's, you know, it's just showing that you, you have resources and you're prepared to defend yourself, just like anything with the law, right? Like people are afraid, lawyers are afraid of taking on, you know, people who have resources and, and stuff. So, you know, I, I think again, like it's really important to respond time in a timely manner. Um, I don't have an exact amount. I think, you know, it really depends on, you know, the, 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 the state and the court and, these things are very protracted nowadays. You know, all these courts have massive backlogs. Um, so anyways, but it's a great question. Yeah. So, but just don't ignore it. And, and Shopify, TPGI, that's Justin. Shopify. So that's your answer, Kevin. Thank you. Justin, Shopify TPGI dashboard works well to scan those sites too. Easy question, but I didn't look it up and wanted to ask. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you can use, well, uh, yeah, I mean, TPGI, we can scan any kind of website, um, any technology, whether it's a, you know, Shopify website, WordPress website, a custom React or Angular website, whatever have you, or Webflow, whatever it be. So yeah, we can scan all of those kinds of websites. Um, we can set up monitoring where you have defensible documentation. You know, again, we save the scan results and over time, just which is confidential your own organization, or you can just use our ARC toolkit and that's free. I encourage you to download and install it. Um, yeah. I hit return to Shopify and Webflow. Um, 
I don't understand the question, but you know what, Justin, um, given that you're referencing Webflow, I'm going to assume you're like a designer. Um, I like Webflow a lot because um, I, I always say this to people is that Webflow is the one site way of building a, you know, it's the one site builder where you can actually create a 100% accessible website using Webflow. It takes effort, but you can do it because with Webflow, you can add whatever ARIA or HTML attributes you want to elements on a page. We know that's very difficult at times to do with Shopify and WordPress themes, right? Like you have to, because again, like you can't go into the theme and make those changes because you want to be able to receive updates to that theme, right? And then when you pull those updates, it's going to override those changes you've made. So, um, but again, Webflow doesn't have that aspect of like the update and version control. And well, they do have version control, but but you're not like pulling these updates from another party. So I like Webflow. I have a lot of thoughts about Webflow. You know, we can save for another conversation. Um, but you were free to talk about it offline, Justin. Um, but yeah, so. Um, all right. Um, yeah, we've had a lot more questions uh, on using Webflow, but we're trying to make sure people don't get too wild. Hey, you know what? One thing that's also nice about Webflow is, you know, there are accessible component libraries you can pull. Um, and uh, again, like, you know, I think Webflow has a pretty savvy audience. Yeah. And and for the record, I've 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 actually been pulled. I've actually been contracted to fix Webflow sites in the past. So so is something I've done. All right. Looks like we have hit the end of our questions. So I'm gonna thank everyone for joining us today. Again, Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, thanks for sending it else they would like to ask, you could reach out to us at info at tpgi.com or at Ida, that's I-D-A, at tpgi.com, and we'll um, make sure we get your questions answered. And thanks so much, and we will see you guys at our next webinar next week. Take care.